in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The devil contradicts God's word, assuring Eve she will not die, but instead, the opposite will happen. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The power of this seduction came in the temptation by the devil to believe that by disobeying God, Adam and Eve would become like him. They chose to believe the lie. They thought they could find life apart from God. They believed that somehow God was holding something back from them. And as a result, he couldn't be trusted. That one act of disobedience brought enmity between God and man. Enmity is separation. Instead of walking with God in the peace of the Garden of Eden and living in union with Him, God drove out the man and set an angel with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Because of sin, Adam and all of mankind is cut off from the source of life. St. Paul sees it this way. This is what he says. Sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin. Death spread to all men because all men sinned. The logical progression is this. Death comes through sin. All men sin. Therefore, all men shall die. St. Paul goes on to describe this fundamental condition like this. He says strongly, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in, once, in which you once walked. So you were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, having no hope and without God in the world. And I realize those are very strong words, especially at 9.30 in the morning, <laughs> when we're all happy-go-lucky kind of folks. It's a very sober and grim picture of what sin has done to the human race. But as hard as it is to hear, we must hear this message. Even us, devout as we are, we must hear this message. I really believe that one of the reasons why the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ has lost some of its appeal in modern day is because we've forgotten that we've fallen. We've lost the sense of the sacred. We've lost our sense of sin. And without any sense of sin and being saved from sin and death, it's no longer relevant. Modern man sees it this way. Wide and broad is the road that leads to life. And basically everybody's going that way. But narrow, very slim, is the road that leads to destruction. You know what? I don't think anybody's going that way. Now it doesn't take a scripture scholar to recognize that that philosophy is the exact opposite of what Jesus actually taught. Now I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but without a clear understanding of this bad news, that we have fallen, that we are inclined to sin, and that the wages of sin are death and separation from God. Without a clear understanding of those critical theological realities, the cross means nothing. And the resurrection holds no power. Accepting Jesus and Lord and Savior is nothing more than a personal preference. It's nice, but not necessary. But it is necessary. Jesus really matters. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son so that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. For the wages of sin are death but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. For what the law could not do, God did by sending His Son into the world. There is nothing, neither height, nor depth, nor angel, nor principality, nor any other thing that can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. In Christ we have redemption, through His blood the forgiveness of sins. When the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son into the world, born of a woman, to redeem those born under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer slaves, but sons. And if a son, then an heir of God in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus really matters. And where you are with him really matters. When the first Adam disobeyed God, Jesus obeyed to the point of death, even dying on a cross. Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, who could not be separated from God, being God himself, willingly assumed an experience of separation from his Father. Being isolated on the cross, surrounded by very few except for his mother and the apostle that he loved. He experienced the anguish, the separation so that we don't have to. He was stripped of his dignity, he assumed our sin, and in our place was nailed to the cross. As a man, Jesus could die on our behalf. But as God, his sacrifice has infinite value. Jesus could redeem a billion worlds. And he can redeem each and every one of us. And he wants to. Good Friday was the day of Passover celebration. And the day that the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. For the previous 1,200 years, the priest would blow a ram's horn at 3 o'clock in the afternoon the moment the lamb was sacrificed. And all the people would pause to contemplate the sacrifice for sins on behalf of the people of Israel. On Good Friday, 3 o'clock, when Jesus was being crucified, he said, it is finished. And at that moment, the moment the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the ram's horn was blown in the temple. The sacrifice of the lamb of God was fulfilled at that hour. At the same time, the veil of the temple, which is a three-inch thick piece of cloth, was ripped in two. This cloth marked the Holy of Holies, and it was ripped in two from top to bottom, representing a removal of the separation between God and man. Jesus came to pay a debt he didn't owe, because we had a debt we couldn't pay. Dying, he destroyed our death, but rising, he restored our life. The passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ breaks the stranglehold of all these oppressive forces in our life. Our doubts vanish when we view Christ's ultimate act of self-gift. Sin's power is washed away by Jesus' precious blood. The legal demands of the law are broken and for, sorry, fulfilled in his act of sacrificial love and the curse is broken. Having dealt with our sin, 